I'm here with Gian Piero Petriglieri, INSEAD Associate Professor of Organizational Behavior, whose latest research documents the exhilaration and occasional despair of independent professionals in what's become known as the gig economy. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Ben. Why did you research this topic? Because we're all independent workers these days, whether we know it or not. Um, and the study really started with um, my co-author, Sue Ashford, a professor at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan, who had uh, long been interested in alternative work arrangements, that is alternative to full-time employment in an organization. And Emmy Versnesky, a professor at the Yale School of Management, who's an authority on the meaning of work. And to be honest, there was also a personal motivation for me. I spent five years working independently before I joined INSEAD, and I just couldn't see my experience of those years reflected in the academic literature or in the management press, um, which is very often about how people endure or leave or lead um, working lives in large organizations. And yet, there's, um, there's a large portion of um, the workforce that doesn't actually work and live that way. In fact, the numbers put them at over 150 million workers in the United States and Western Europe alone um, across all ranges of professions. So we really wanted to both understand the experience of these workers and also amplify their voices. And then something interesting happened, which is as we started learning their stories and sharing their stories at seminars or in organizations, people started saying, uh, wait a minute, I, I'm not an independent worker. I work at a company, at a consulting firm, at a university, but I also feel that way. You know, the, over the last two or three decades, we've been telling people, you know, make your work more meaningful, take charge of your careers, you know, uh, express yourself, make your work um, who you are. And what we ended up uh, finding out was what it takes to do that, to have that personal relationship with work, and also what it does to you. And what does it do to you? <laughs> what it does is that it frees you up and it freaks you out at the same time, to put it bluntly. Or as we put it in our, in our research in slightly more academic term, is that work becomes personal and precarious at the same time, and so does your identity. You see, once what you do becomes who you are, you have a tremendous amount of freedom, you have a tremendous amount of choice, especially as you become more successful, you can choose what you do, where you work, how you work, uh, who you work for. But at the same time, work also becomes very exposing. When it succeeds, you succeed. When it fails, you fail. And um, if your work is yourself, what happens when you stop working? I mean, I know this might sound, um, uh, a touch dramatic, but really, psychologically speaking, work becomes a little bit a matter of life or death. In organizations, that can be true as well. There's a lot of anxiety, a lot of uncertainty. Um, that's true. And you might feel like, you know, maybe I have my job today or I don't have my job tomorrow. But there are two differences um, that in our mind, distinguish an organizational working life from an independent working life. The first one is that we need to distinguish between two types of anxiety. One is a social anxiety, and that's what we often focus on in the organization, which is, will people recognize my performance? Will I be accepted? Will I be included? And then later on, will I have status? Will people listen to my voice? Will I be able to lead? Um, there's another kind of anxiety, however, which we focus on, which is existential anxiety. Do I know who I am? Can I be the person I aspire to be? How long will this last? Um, what will happen you know, when, um, when I can't do any more what I, what I wish and, um, and aspire to do? The extremity of that emotional oscillation, how do they manage it? Well, this is, uh, I think, the crux of the study. What we found is that while people took enormous pride in claiming their independence, claiming this ability to endure and enjoy the ups and downs, um, be them financial, be them social, be them emotional, of this free and independent life, at the same time, they spend a huge amount of energy cultivating connections 
that allow them to both keep going and to pour themselves into their work. And we specifically found four categories of connections. Connections to routines, which they really religiously, almost religiously cultivated. Connections to specific places that made them feel this is where I'm at work, this is where I'm into my work. Connections to people that encourage them and embolden them at the same time, specific people, very often few, two, three people um, maximum. And then connection to a sense of purpose, a sense of this is my work and this is not my work and this is the meaning it has and this is the value it offers, this is the function it serves um, for other people, you know, in the, in the kind of most extreme senses, uh, in the most extreme cases for, for society at large. What does success look and feel like outside the context of an organization? Um, within an organization, usually over time, um, if you succeed, you have a certain amount of security and a certain amount of status. You know, those are traditional markers of success, if you want, in the literature, but also in the experience of, um, of work. And for these people, what we find is success meant something different, and we use these two words in the study, viability of identity and vitality of the self. And viability of identity was a certain amount of stability, not complete stability, but a certain sense that I can, that I have the ability and opportunity to continue doing what the work that defines and develops myself. And vitality, conversely, was this sense that I am open, I'm as open as possible to experience life as it comes and to learn and grow from it. And so, you see, as one of the people we interviewed put it, is uh, you want to have a certain amount of structure and predictability, but not so much that your heart isn't open to surprise. And, um, and that, in some sense, was, um, you know, was a definition of success in an independent working life. If someone is thinking about leaving an organization to become an independent contractor in the gig economy, what should they think about? That's, um, that's a great question. Well, two things. First of all, that excitement and insecurity that you're feeling just thinking about it, that's going to be amplified and it's not going to go away. So just be ready to understand that this is normal, this is what you're signing up for, and if you're successful, it's only going to become more, perhaps more intense and more frequent, but you're going to learn to actually enjoy it as opposed to dread it, which is the way we think of it in traditional careers. Um, and the second thing is um, don't start when you're independent to build those resources, you know, to build certain routines, to build certain people that can support you, to build, uh, you know, a sense that you know where you work at your best, a definition of what's the purpose of your work as opposed to, you know, what's the requirements of your role. Because in many ways, um, you know, those resources that allow you to live and lead a full independent working lives, you can also very often develop them within an organization, within a company, and very often companies that are smart um, will attract talent by saying, you know, uh, if you come here, we'll actually help you develop the resources that will, um, that will allow you to make your work more personal, more meaningful, more impactful, and then you can take them with you. So, you know, they will make you more portable. Thanks very much. You're very welcome.